online teaching tools and making that transition. Now, I know many of you have already begun to uh, teach, particularly those of you who are in schools, because many schools have begun with online teaching. But one must remember that in India, we still have a lot of children who go to schools where perhaps it's not yet begun, maybe for various reasons, from infrastructure to connectivity to cost to so on and so forth. So spare a thought for them. Uh, a lot of their teachers may be attending our webinars and need help in getting started. So we're very happy to kind of bridge the gap and make or help make this transition. Now, some of you teachers I know are exceedingly senior, very well experienced with some of the leading schools in the country. And some of this you may find slightly simplistic, but we thought we'd much rather in the interest of being thorough, start from the very beginning. And as we go along, start to build up the complexity of all the tools and all that we offer. So on that note, let's begin. Um, this is what I hope to cover in today's webinar. A little bit about the teaching landscape, the approach to instruction, learning, that is 15 online tools and 10 starter tips. So <laughs> I've got my hands full and um, I do hope you genuinely enjoy today's session and can benefit and enrich yourself, your students, your school and other teachers as well. So here goes. Um, the teaching landscape, of course, I think has changed in the last couple of months. Um, I've put this as realities of a teacher then. And when you read through some of these points, that then seems like it was many, many years ago. Of course, this was just a few months ago when a lot of us thought either at home or privately or in students' homes, where a lot of us did both group learning, individual teaching. We still used a lot of physical copies of material. In the old days, we used to say we cyclostyle the sheets, um, but we use Xerox and whatever. And of course, all of that now is kind of out the window. So yay for paper and saving paper. Uh, but with that has also come a few challenges. So um, in the normal classes, we had a kind of very um, direct involvement with students, which allowed us to observe, which allowed us to um, observe micro expressions, nuances, and so on and so forth, which perhaps now is a bit of a challenge uh, given the uh, diffused medium that we use. Um, in the past, when we used to give homework, there was no direct way to really watch what was happening except to see the final product. But now, thanks to technology, we can do that. And of course, the old days of preparing for an exam had a lot to do with a pile of books, a finger in the right direction, and off we went. Today that has changed, and now we're in a situation where we're still the same teachers, okay? But now we've blinked twice. And the reason why we've blinked is because these different tools have kind of taken over us in a manner of speaking, leading to a lot of, lot of confusion. And some of us have managed to kind of get our heads around it. Some of us are still struggling, but more importantly, and I have no doubt that in time to come, being teachers, we will rise up to the occasion and conquer this too. In fact, a lot of teachers, and my hat's off to you, um, in a span of literally a month or a month and a half, kind of went from offline to online with relatively very, very um, a high percent of success that now we're kind of running in uh, the pace to kind of um, sustain it. But the teacher of now also has a few things to look at, is how do we sustain? Because you see engagement being what it is, and if it's online, a lot of students get bored quite easily. So they very conveniently put off their mic or put off their camera, and you're wondering how can I keep them engaged? You as a teacher perhaps may also be a little frustrated because you're not really sure, you know the child, you want to help the child, but you cannot because of the physical distance. And we still keep asking ourselves, am I doing enough? Am I using the right tools? Uh, could I have done something better? That's the teacher in us that will always ask those questions. So the new reality of a teacher now is work from home. First, try and find a nice workspace at home. Um, and if you're lucky, you will be able to do that. Otherwise, it's a little bit of juggling day in and day out, connectivity issues and so on. Um, but I think the two largest areas that really trouble us is points five and six. 
is there is little or no group interaction or social skills for the children to physically be in touch. In fact, I'm sure you know this, but most homeschooling parents will always talk about how everything is great except that my child does not have a chance to play with other children or that still remains a challenge. And now more than ever, we're seeing this. And the other challenge that we face is with children with special needs who need that one-on-one um, -on -one contact, who need the kinesthetic approach to be shown and to get physically involved, that they are also now unfortunately struggling. So going forward, we have quite a lot of challenges to also work towards. Um, but the realities of the teacher of tomorrow is going to look something like bionic man, as you can see on your image. But this is a great time, I think, for us with a little bit, I'm not saying any actually, but just a little bit of the wee bit of downtime that we may get. And I know it's actually double the work now that we teach online, but it's time to also look at growing our knowledge, growing our skills, um, changing our approaches, and most importantly, now all of a sudden from teachers, we are being learners. Some of the senior teachers tell me that now they have to rely on their children in the home to kind of set up the connection for them. And I'm sure you'll find this, um, uh, or you'll have a hint of a smile um, if you are one of those teachers. But that is the new reality. Uh, it's a proven fact that every 10 years, the construct of the physical brain changes. And the pathways that join the connectivity is far more enhanced in a child of this generation. Um, and I can't even say Gen Z because they're way even younger than that um, compared to us. So we have to be vulnerable and be willing to learn and not feel bad at all about something like that. Um, of course, the challenge of being heard and seen in a crowded space online still remains a bit of a challenge. And as we go forward, there are there's going to be newer demands, but that we need to be aware of. Many of us are used to teaching in a writing kind of environment or read-write environment with maybe 30, 40, 50, and sometimes sadly 70 children in the class. And now all of a sudden trying to do that with sound and video is sounds very convenient and easy, but is a real, real challenge. So these are some of the things that we still need to sort out. And fortunately, the future... Um, things like micro expressions and nuance where artificial intelligence will play a role to be able to help mitigate, to be able to help uh, us uh, pass that curve a little more smoothly. So the big five changes that we see, hybrid learning is here to stay. Competition is global. So now we are seeing a situation where very good teachers are being approached by multiple schools because they've got different hours. So uh, a teacher's ability to shine is now not just through saying, my students did well, you have now multiple offers, um, which is a really, really good thing because in the past, um, if there's one most overseen or most um, never seldom kind of um, uh, appreciated um, in, in, in the real world way is the teaching community. Kids do very well. Parents reward kids. Everybody rewards the kids, uh, which is brilliant. Um, but teachers, after 20, 30 years, all right, with all that knowledge, now the world awaits. So you can have your future students from any part of the world. Um, if you are a good teacher, sound in, um, in what you're doing. Uh, of course, augmentation technologies will be there to kind of help us along the way. And now, more than ever, teachers will become entrepreneurs only because um, the scale of teaching is still mass. The scale of effectiveness of online teaching may be in a mass medium or mass media, but the engagement with children is not quite the same as it was in a physical class. So there are many more students um, who will need many more teachers to help augment what they are already learning. So, and given the fact that you're already working on your own terms, from your own time, from your own home, it's but natural that the next stage will happen is you may become an entrepreneur and don't shy away from it. Um, it's about time, I think. 
Um, that being said, education will still and always remain a group learning and teaching activity. Now, moving from there, let's start with what we do know, because this is currently what we are most secure in, the pedagogy or the andragogy, depending on whether we're working with young learners or with adults. Uh, one thing that we are secure of is the teaching context. That hasn't changed. The learners are still the same. We know their needs, their interests, how to engage them, what kinds of activities are to motivate them. What has changed, though, is a little bit of the instructional approach because of the medium and the feedback mechanisms. So this leads me now to our next stage, all right, which is to look at the instructional approach. Now, I would shared this image with you in a webinar that I did sometime last month, where we spoke of the need more than ever now to build communicative classrooms. Because even though we're in an online medium, finally the child has to tell the teacher, I did not understand. Now more than ever, previously the teacher could just notice the face and say, well, I understand he's not picked up or she's not picked up. And the teacher could walk over. But now everyone needs to be that little extra bit communicative. So building a communicative classroom is the, was already the next step in evolution probably 50 years ago. And there are many parts to building a communicative classroom from the approach to the lesson planning, the staging, how do you maintain the authority, what kind of seating, what kind of grouping, most importantly, how much of teacher talk time, how much of stu uh, student talk time, uh, are all factors that start to weigh in building a communicative classroom. So this is a good overview to look at because the, we need to now do all of this within the digital medium. So tools, techniques are now no longer tools and techniques. They're now pretty much the, um, it's required in the, the regular trade. It's not an extension. It's not an addition. It's not a must have, or I'm sorry, I'd like to have. It's a must have now. So when we look at lesson planning, okay, this is traditionally what we would do in lesson planning as teachers. You would present a little bit in your class, okay, and explain the concept. Thereafter, you'd have the children or the students practice, but in a bit of a controlled environment where you are giving them a little bit of feedback constantly. So they try, you give a little bit of feedback, their production then becomes a little bit more established. So it becomes like a freer practice where they can now try it on their own. And then finally, when they can own the task is when we call personalization. So we used to do all of this in the confines of this physical class. It was a live class. We gave them feedback in the class and we gave homework. And it was all of this was in that. But now suddenly the model has changed where we have to go from the physical in-person class to the digital class. And in the digital class, things need to be slightly better thought through, better compartmentalized, because now on one hand, we do not have the luxury of being with the children in the class, but we are aided to some extent by technology. So now our lesson starts with where the blue arrow hits the grayish blue button, is you start with a pre-lesson task, which is normally some sort of maybe reading material or a short video that you may have recorded or some sort of instruction or maybe something to um, a PDF document to read or something to uh, refer to. And then the child comes into the live class, which is online. And it's in this time that you're really going to use that time to clarify and present, to give feedback while they've already understood some part of it prior to the lesson. But now's a chance to use the time to practice together, to self-correct, and then you need to give them a little bit of homework, which they can then take and go and do in either a group scenario or um, have some study material to refer to, to be able to help them. 
So this has now become the next stage. And then, of course, it comes back full circle. But while all this is happening, we must also keep in mind what we refer to as the interaction. Oops. Okay, sorry. My mouse went to sleep. Uh, we must keep in mind all the interaction patterns that are required. Okay, so we still have to keep the dynamic in mind of the teacher being able to clarify, present to the whole class. We still need to keep in mind the teacher needs to be able to interact with the learner and learner with learner. So pair work needs to exist and group work also needs to exist. So all of these things have to now coexist. And the good part, though, is that it is possible to do it thanks to technology um, to a great extent being an enabler over here. Now, this hence now requires us as teachers to also review our workload. So now we have to plan a lot and I'm sure you will all agree with me that as in online teaching is as people may think you don't leave your home and that it's very convenient, but it is physically fatiguing and draining. It is, you spend a lot of time conceiving each and every lesson in detail. You need to plan what you're going to do. You need to prepare the resources for that. You need to maybe send it out in advance. You then need to deliver the lesson. You then need to reflect on what went right or wrong. And then most importantly, you have to communicate that either to the children or to the uh, parents or to your uh, colleagues in school or to the management in the school. So all of this, our workload has also changed. And there's no two ways about that. And it's become physically fatiguing. Three hours of online lessons is probably worth about seven hours of physical lessons. That's my um, interpretation based on what I've been doing. Uh, and it's just exhausting. All right. That being said, this also gives us a lot of clarity in the way we teach. Because before a lesson, we read, we think it through, we listen, we watch, we start put together some sort of study input. And the first time you're doing it, yes, it seems very, very involving and it takes a lot of time. But once we get the hang of it, we then know, okay, fine, before the lesson, this is what we need to do. During the lesson, we will perhaps reread what we read earlier. We will rewatch or we will clarify or we will personalize it and we will practice. And then after the lesson, we will can kind of consolidate it individually or we will consolidate in groups and prepare for the next class. So we also in the bargain have become far more precise and far more uh, calibrated in the way we approach our lesson planning, lesson staging, lesson execution, and most importantly, in the reflection that happens after the class. So this is a little bit about what happens at that stage, which brings me now to our next area, which is learning. And in this stage, we are aided by these terms, synchronous and asynchronous. Now, I know by now all of you teachers know what that means, but to put it very simply, Synchronous learning is when you are doing it live and in the class, okay? And asynchronous learning is everything that you would do perhaps before the class, after the class, as well as to manage the class because it's not happening in front of the students, but nonetheless, it is very, very important for the execution of your learning or your teaching for the learners. And in addition to all of this, okay, we also must keep in mind that we need to even have a backup plan. And the reason why I say backup plan is, because, for instance, in our case, all our webinars, if you miss it, we have a backup plan. We have a recording. So we can always tell you, please go and have a look at the recording. And I know schools are also doing that. And sometimes this can happen because technology being what it is, it's a great savior, but you know how it is. Sometimes when you need it the most, you just won't have it. So hence, you must at least have a black backup or plan for a backup. 
So the obvious one is to record. The other one is, of course, to create that whole WhatsApp network um, to be able to actually uh, use that um, in case you needed to go to your second line of defense. So that's a little bit about the two types of learnings. So now let's look a little closer at what do you do with, sorry, with what do you do with synchronous learning and where do you begin? So again, these logos, I'm sure now you can see them even when you close your eyes at night when you're sleeping because they're just coming out of your ears, nose and eyes and everywhere else. Because what we did not know probably three months ago, we are now living with morning, noon and night. So from research, little research that I saw the other day, many are using Zoom, some are using Microsoft Teams. Google is, of course, there. There are some with WebEx and Classera and various other softwares. So my first suggestion to you is begin, and particularly if you have to make the decision. If the decision is made for you, then, well, that's just it. You, the decision is made. But if you've got to choose a decision, all right, look at the features of what each one offers you. Okay. Now, by the way, this was a couple of months ago. Uh, in this ecosystem, everything is changing. So 40 minutes would have been knocked out for the educational account. Sometimes they will do a promo and so on and so forth. But you need to get in place your basics. Basics means a system where you can communicate voice, video. You can do it for maybe 10, 15, 20, depending on how big your class size is or what your need is. You have a way to create a little small space for them. And thereafter, you can start to look at various value additions. Now, when it comes to asynchronous learning, don't worry, I'm coming back to the synchronous bit in a little bit in a little while. When it comes to the asynchronous bit, email is your first line of defense. Screencasts are your next, and I'll talk about this in a second. And of course, your learning management system. So let's look at what we can do with email. Of course, we are now all pretty um, sava with emails because we've been doing it now for the better part of our lives. Um, even email seems old for us. So it's good. That's the only thing uh, which is as old as us probably. Um, everything else is like five times newer. But with emails, what we can do now is help in the structuring and the planning. So we can communicate our objectives. Let's say that you do this every Monday morning or you do this one day in the week where you communicate your learning objectives and your outcomes for the week. Through emails, you can set reminders with links to your sessions, your times for submission of homework and so on. So you program this once in the week and it's done. You can also email various materials that need to be used for the lessons in the week so that they have some um, study material or they have reference material or they need to look at something in advance that can be communicated through email. And of course, through email, you can invite feedback. And of course, you know this is easily done with Google Forms. But we come now to screencasts because screencasts are a very important component. It's a very simple tool, okay, for those of you who've not heard of this before, uh, although I'm very sure most of you have. It's a very simple way to sh do something on your computer screen and you can talk over with the instructions and the computer records both what is happening on the screen as well as your instructions. And that is something that you can then send along to your students. So screencasts are very, very effective if you're looking at these kind of lesson shapes, okay? Maybe you want to use it in the PPP model by sending the lesson to them recorded. A lot of schools who are having connectivity issues are using this, or a lot of schools where sadly the children may not be able to afford a smart device um, or the connectivity is not the best. This is the ideal way to do it is the teacher records it um, maybe in the school or at home. Uh, and thereafter it goes out through WhatsApp. It's a little neat compact recording. And thereafter the children can practice and they can try it on their own. If you're using it in the TTT model, all right, again, you can give the children a task to test them. 
based on their feedback that you see, you can now give out a clarifying video to teach them and again, ask them to revert with whatever they've got different. And finally, of course, in um, the TBL way, you can also look at it in the case of language focus, where there's a pre-task, test, test, the language focus. All right, so you can give very, very specific uh, instructions on um, how they can use this in, the, in their learning. All right, so moving ahead, um, I'm coming back now to how to use screencasts and which are the kind of service, uh, services to look at. Um, so these are the various service providers. Almost all of them have free plans. Um, Screencast-O-Matic is normally a, quite the favorite and Screencastify, all right? These are by and large the favorites with everybody. Now, of course, whatever floats your boat, please use that. Um, I don't get any endorsement from any, or any of these companies anyway. So please feel free to use whatever you are very comfortable with. At the end of the day, technology in a teaching environment is only a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. You as a teacher are that end with the learner. So please use whatever you think is right for you. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the resources or some of the service providers that are there. Um, let's talk now a little bit about the um, LMS or the learning management system. <clears throat> so, you know, there is a lot of confusion about this. An LMS can be as complicated as you want it to be, or it can be as simplistic as you want it to be. Let me give you an example. What does an LMS do? It documents in one place all your course material, whatever kind of communication you may have with your learners, the activities, all right, some sort of the reports or the self-access materials is one part. The other part is it interacts. It, some of them, there'll be modules just between the learners and the school or the learners and the teacher. Uh, so that's another part that it can also manage for you. Sending out emails, dividing, creating groups, uh, sending, um, creating pairs for pair work. So it's all basically... Um, a computer on a little bit of a high charge uh, that's doing, that's multitasking for you. And of course, the LMS might also be able to send out messages and alerts to parents. Now, this is fine. If you are a school, you must be looking at one of these. Chances are you've already got one of these. Uh, but if you are not a school and you are a teacher who's starting off, uh, please don't be inundated with fear. It's very, very simple to get your head around this. These are the various service providers that are there. PB Works is like a wiki. It's from wiki. Moodle is, everybody seems to talk of Moodle because it is free and open source. But I assure you, it does require you to have some elementary knowledge of coding or how, code, how it works, at least. Um, School, Schoology is there. The Google Classroom, of course, is there. Uh, so you can use those. Edumodo is also there. But you know what? If you ask me, if you're old-fashioned and you are, you are pretty neat and array, uh, able to organize not just your thoughts, but your material and your whole structure, use Dropbox. All right. Now, someone might call me exceedingly antiquated for saying that. But guess what, guys? It's a fraction of the cost. It's, you do not run the risk of suddenly one SMS or one mail going out to parents with something that was never intended or not required or jumped the gun, all right? So don't get me wrong. These LMSs are very strong, very secure. But if you are a teacher and you're starting off on your own, Dropbox is a great service. It's basically your virtual computer. So you don't need to have something exceedingly fancy in terms of even machinery, just a simple computer with a good Dropbox and storage account. And you can literally create as many folders you want over there. And all your material is secure for you to access. Okay. And you can even sync it. You can keep it the part on your computer, part, maybe back it up once a week or whatever you want. 
<coughs> excuse me so this is a little bit about the lms service providers now whatever you do with whatever you're trying to do i can only suggest a very simple thing that applies to art they say teaching is like art and in the art world there is this saying when it comes to design less is more and i say this not because you do nothing in the class but because clarity of purpose and objective is what is the less part and because you have laser focused on building activities on creating material on delivering a lesson plan to bring out that one objective it lands up being more than trying to amuse the child in that one hour or 45 minute lecture that we currently do online so you are not an entertainer you are not a juggler you are a teacher and as teachers we need to concentrate on the objective because the objective at the end of the day is worth a lot more on that note i've now come to the next section which is the online tools and if you don't mind this section is going to be a little bit of a challenge for me as well as for you uh, chandra i will need your help for feedback to know whether it's going as planned okay yes sure uh, before i get any further i just want to cover the basics uh, for you <clears throat> this is what the basic functionality of any um meeting software that you're using is should have uh i normally in my very first lesson with learners particularly young learners take them through the functionality of each of these buttons of course many of them can also take you through it um uh, even before you can approach it because they already are using it they know what it does but the reason why i do this is because i think it helps set a little bit of a code of conduct all right you tell them when to mute when they come on what do they do when they want to speak they raise their hands if they are appreciative of someone they clap or they smile and so on and so forth all right so you of course please tell them not to touch the security settings uh very often you will see students doodling away with your annotation tool while you are trying to deliver the most intense part of the subject um so you can even through your settings control all of that um the other part that kind of helps your functionality is these two things screen sharing and breakout rooms now screen sharing will allow you to basically create a virtual medium and bring your classroom into the cloud it will be able to let you share video audio and everything else it can take back comments from students that are written and literally everything in between breakout rooms allow for you to split your group up into smaller groups different service providers whether it is zoom or google or whoever give you this function and a breakout i know in zoom for instance you get as many as 50 breakout rooms okay so even if you want to use one breakout room just to keep all the naughty kids where they can want to yell at 9 o'clock in the morning at themselves put them in that one room for 5 minutes and then bring them back in all right so breakout rooms are very very good can be used in a variety of creative ways by the way i was only kidding about the naughty kids um but of course you could do that as well um so using the breakout rooms is also a very good functionality for this now i thought i would play the video for you but quite frankly if you go to any of your service providers whether it's zoom or google and just type how to create a breakout room either you'll get it on youtube or you'll get a lot of tutorials that will show you step by step how to do this okay so i'm going to move through this slide and and come over here now i'm now on to the section of online tools and in the online tools what i'd really like to do is be able to show you what each one does so i'm going to try this um chanda please tell me if you can see the screen that is zooming up oh uh, not yet not yet no okay can you see this now yes now i can okay so everybody i'm using a website over here called www.answergarden.ch 
Okay, this is a great site to use if you want to create a brainstorm. So I'm going to do this with you right now. So I'm saying create an answer garden. So I'm typing over here, what is your favorite color? Okay, now don't worry, you still cannot answer this. I have options, whether I can put it in a brainstorm mode or a classroom mode, and each mode has a different uh, abilities that you can seek from your learners. So it can be as a moderator mode and you can also even lock it. You can even limit the number of how long you want your answer to be 20 characters or 40 characters. You can lock it as a password. You can even send an email around it and so on. You can choose the case and you can keep it as whether others can also share. So that's the big thing, by the way, about all these online tools is what one teacher uses, another teacher can also use if you want to and vice versa. And I think that's brilliant. And I think that's true community building among teachers. So now just to show you, I'm keeping this alive and I'm saying create. Okay. Now I've created uh, an answer garden. You can see this over here. What is your favorite color? I'm now copying this link and in the chat, I am going to place this over there and send it to all of you. What I would like for you to do is click on that link and start to type in your answers. Okay, please just one color is more than enough. I'm gonna choose um, something exceedingly weird like turquoise and I'm gonna say refresh. So answer garden, by the way, So Answer Garden is this great way to create a live brainstorm. And um, it can be very, very effective. Um, and as people start typing in the answer, the same answer more or less. So if you say, what would you like to do? Or pick a topic that we should all talk about. So someone will say hiking or biking or whatever. The, as the answers keep getting repeated, the font size on that screen starts to increase. Okay, so that is how you can use uh, Answer Garden. Uh, the other um, tool is this one. Uh, this is very good for ebooks. If you, as a school, have something called ebooks, subscription to an ebook service, uh, or you're test trialing some publishers' books that are of an e version, uh, then you would be able to use uh, some of these. Um, of course, this. I think all of us online today is a real test of my internet connection. So, which is probably why uh, this is taking so long. Um, oh, there you go. Um, so if you can see this all, this is a book. All right, this is very good for very young learners, particularly eBooks because it's interactive. Kids want to play with it. Uh, invariably, even if they're the naughty ones, uh, the minute they see stuff like this happening and that they can control it and they can click something over here, uh, they're thrilled. The noise of the page turning also is brilliant for them. They pay a lot of attention and this is a great way to also use it. Now, besides that, there's also um, uh, Oxford. In fact, Oxford does publish some books for Trinity as well, um, which is uh, kind of helpful. So yes, here, as you can see, uh, I'm going inside <coughs> the pile. Um, so sometimes even as teachers, you may get a lot of free resources based on a lot of trial material that is also there. So I'm just flipping through this. Uh, you can even embed this, as you can see. I'm zooming in. And on the right hand side, you can see over here, various resources that are available that you could use. All right. Now keep in mind, um, I'm demonstrating this to you from my desktop. And you're probably if you're watching it on your phone, it's not going to be the easiest. But all that I'm telling you uh, can be done. I, I promise you it can be done because we do use it uh, almost day in and day out. So please don't worry. Um, here, of course, we are also testing the internet connection at its very best or worst. Um, by the way, just to let you know, um, on this very same site, 
if you go and search for Trinity, Jesse, um, you will also see a whole list of uh, books that you could uh, buy. Of course, please keep in mind that we in Trinity believe that it's better to teach you how to teach rather than to become dependent on resources. But if you're a new teacher or you want to uh, get some ideas, then all of these books are available for different grades in Jesse and so on with ISE as well. Okay, sorry, I just thought I should show you that because we were on their website. Now, moving ahead, um, this is another one, one of my favorites, quizlet.com. I'm quite sure that you've seen it. It's used by over 300 million people around the world. It's brilliant because it uses gaming right through and through. Okay, so I'm going to um, try and make this as big a screen as I can. Okay, so you don't necessarily need an account. So I've created an account, which is a free account. So let me just show you how this works. So let's say I want to work with prepositions of time. Okay, so uh, all I need to really do is either I've created my own, or let's say I have not created my own, and I want to search for, let's say, prepositions of um, movement. Oops. So let's say I want to search for prepositions of movement. It will give me a whole list of what other teachers may have also done. Premium means I need to pay for it, but there are a lot of free resources as well. Okay, so here you can see this is created by other teachers from different parts of the world, and they've already created their sets. Okay. So normally on the left hand side, and it's still loading here, you can see, you can just opt for the free ones. And maybe it will filter it out to what you can use, you can click on it, and you can make it your own by adapting to it. So just to show you what for instance, how I've used it uh, in one example, um, to, uh, to um, look at prepositions, or let's say summer holidays. I was doing this with young learners in lieu of this year's missed summer holidays that I had to show them a virtual holiday. So in a case like this, I uh, gave them uh, words or vocabulary words that would help them. And what happened? Oh, it's opening. Um, and over here, all I did is I had to create one set or one list. <coughs> Okay, so for instance, seashell, I defined all things that you would basically find on a holiday from sightseeing. And this gives you the option to not just put in a word, to put in the definition, to put in an image, and maybe even put in a video or a sound. And straight away, this would link to Google. Okay, so once I've done that, I create flashcards are automatically created. Learning is automatically created. So for instance, to go by ship, that's by train, plane, or whatever. If I click on it to use a means of transport to go abroad or to another city. So then I go to the next one and I say, what is the destination? The place one wants to go to. Um, and I go to the next one again. <coughs> Excuse me. What is a hotel? Okay. A place to stay. Um, and so on and so forth. Who is a travel agency? So I can augment it with bed and breakfast tent, all the words that they would use. Now I could test them or get them to do activities in different ways. <coughs> Excuse me. So I could get them to write. So a special plant growing near the sea. So it could be a palm tree. So let's try palm uh, tree. And as I say, answer, it will say either it's incorrect or it's correct. So as you can see, the correct bar went on. Dangerous fish with razor sharp teeth. So this is another way to engage them. It also works in spellings. And then, of course, there's the audio version where you can spell. You can test them. And finally, of course, they can play a match with themselves and time themselves. So I say start game. And it's still loading, by the way. That The game is not a blank screen. Um, and it should be there any second or minute now, I guess. So it's loading. So obviously this is a strain, but otherwise it should basically be there, but then you can click and drag and mix and match 
and so on and so forth. So um, this is also another kind of um, software to use, Quizlet. Uh, you can test them, by the way. So here, the written questions with the images, matching, and so on. So this is free to use. You can upgrade also to the level of a teacher if you'd like. Okay, so that's Quizlet. Now let's move on to Padlet. They're not cousins uh, in any way, but Padlet is like a lovely thing to use as sticky notes. Um, so I'm going to try and take you online to Padlet. Um, Chanda, are we good? Can we all see Padlet? Not yet. We can see a blank screen. Okay, fine. That's good enough for me. <laughs> 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 so that should come up in a second. Uh, so Padlet is also one of these things where you can create a lot of sticky notes on the multiple topics. Uh, it's colorful. You can create, it's free. Uh, by the way, all these tools that I'm sharing with you are like 90% free. And if you do have to pay, it's probably just for a small upgrade uh, of some sort uh, or the other. So this is Padlet. Uh, Padlet lets me create basically multiple blackboards of sticky notes. And I can use it. I can change my backgrounds. <clears throat> I can make it as interesting as um, uh, the kids would love to see it. Okay, so there's it. Um, this is the gallery that's opening up. Um, sorry, I need to log in. Oops. Well, that's a chore in itself. Um, so teachers, I'm really sorry. Um, if there's anything I can do, it's, I will do it for you. But if there's one thing I cannot do is control the internet connection. Um, so, which is why I'm at the mercy. Um, but effectively over here, Padlet is also something that I think I would suggest you all try. Um, it's very good to be able to use in spontaneous tasks, to be used as a, si a simulation um, and also a stimulation. I'm going to get out of this, uh, but it kind of helps teachers to uh, be creative, to be innovative, and it's naturally very intuitive to use. So you, there, there's also an app that you can use so you can design some stuff and the kids can do it for homework at home as well. Uh, which brings me to um, the next uh, bit which is something called Jigsaw Planet. Um, I know I'm being a sucker for punishment, but I'm going to try it one more time and see whether Jigsaw Planet at least will open up. Uh, so Jigsaw Planet is one of those things where it gamifies everything. So you can see there are already puzzles and I think we all know that kids love puzzles. So um, you can actually create your own puzzle. So for instance, uh, let's say I want to create a puzzle. Um, I've chosen create. I, could, I choose my file. So let me see, I think on the desktop I have a file. So this is a picture for, let's say, I spy. I can choose how many pieces I want it to be, whether four, six, 20, 50, 300 pieces also. And I can even choose the shapes. So let's say I want it in 15 pieces. I'm working with young learners um, and I want to keep the shapes quite simple and I can either allow for rotation or not allow for it. And um, the folder where I'm saving it is called reading skills. So I can now say create. And what it will do is I've just uploaded a picture of, um, of a barn or a, uh, or a farm. Um, and it is creating for me um, a puzzle which I can share with the children or I can share with learners. So I can use more complex things. Uh, I know Shoma in our last uh, webinar spoke about how you could take different pieces of text and puzzle it up. I think the resource she referred to was called Jigsaw. And um, here also you can do this. Um, it's quite simple uh, and kids love it. So you want to take any, any subject and puzzle it up, then this is the way to do it. Um, it's about to load. Um, and so too is Christmas coming. So might be about the same time, but let's just give it maybe three seconds more. A one, a two, oh, there's it. Okay. So here you can see, um, I have mouse control. Now, if you can see my screen, you can also give remote control or mouse control to your learners. So this is fun. This kind of keeps them engaged. 
No one is falling asleep at nine o'clock in the morning. And you can create a game out of this. And you say, I want you, uh, I spy with my little eye, um, a green truck. So everyone's looking for the green truck. Okay, fine. Now they're looking at what's the shape of that. So this is actually like a parallelogram. So you can kind of teach math along with this, so depending on the shapes. And then you can kind of teach logic and critical thinking as well and say, do you think this kind of shape, which is very odd over here, would it come in the side? So they say no. So then you say, okay, maybe it should go in the corner over here. It might fit here. But then you say it's not straight. So this way you get children to, it also helps with motor skills. It helps with uh, decision-making, thinking, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so that's Jigsaw Planet. Yeah, it worked. Uh, this is another one, Earth Cam. I'm not even going to attempt it, but this is basic, very, uh, this is brilliant. Uh, this has cameras all around the world. If you want to go and look at, let's say, the Panda Cam in China. Listen, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little, uh, oops. I'm going to really try to see if we can go to the Panda Cam. But it's great for observational stuff. So if you're doing with little children, um, or let's say, for instance, one of the locations, oh, it's not bad, it's quite fast. Uh, so let's say I'm going to search for um, Abbey Road, um, which is the house of the Beatles in London, because I know they have a lovely camera out there. And it's, if you're working with children on uh, prepositions, um, where's that gone? Oh, here's it. Here's it. Beatles Abbey Road Crossing. Uh, this is kind of live right now. So you can talk with the children and you all are discussing in real time. Um, the bus is coming and so and so stand behind that. What kind of clothes are they using? What colors? Um, and so on. So uh, you can use, there are cameras from practically every part of the world. Please be sure to check the camera in advance. You don't want, uh, of course, there's no inappropriate content, but you want to make sure that it's age appropriate, at least for your learners. So, um, So for some reason, this is, well, what happened? Okay. Uh, So it's 12.31 in the afternoon over there. This is live. Uh, I think it's just loading up the visual or the camera. Um, but I've actually done this in a class with young learners and we were discussing who was standing in front of, what items of clothing, what color uh, was the clothing, were they being good citizens by crossing on the road when there was uh, no signal. So there you go. So this is a live camera. So here we can talk about uh, the colors of cars, people on the roads, statues, signals. Um, of course, here you can't see the signal, but in another angle, there is one. Uh, buses coming and going and so on and so forth. All right, so great observational stuff. We can talk about life, the real world, and everything in between. Um, so that is EarthCam. Uh, just like that, you can do this with something called AccuWeather. Um, AccuWeather will basically talk about the weather from different parts of the world with interesting videos. You can get children to model themselves as presenters based on a newscast or a weather forecast. So that is also a possibility. Um, it kind of helps with exchanging or building pleasantries while talking. So I know in India, we kind of do not have varying weather, but I think it's always appropriate, uh, particularly when we travel to learn to know that we can talk about the weather and to use various dynamics of it. So that's AccuWeather. There's another one called voicethread.com. Uh, and this one is uh, great because uh, you can you record a voice thread, you share it with your friends, um, they can comment on it. Um, and it's not just that, they can doodle on it as well. And it becomes really interesting because there's a lot of creativity that can be used for 
on voicethread.com. The best part is if you have a school or your school is using a learning management software, then all of this can also be integrated into that. Which brings me to the other one, which is flipgrid.com. I think many of you know what this is. Uh, the Flipgrid is a great um, video recording um, software for young learners. It's very um, social media feel like. So it's very popular with the teenagers. Um, you can add filters, you can add stickers, a whiteboard. Um, and you, most importantly, you can share it. Um, and there are lots of tutorials. You don't need to sign up for it. Uh, maybe just the teacher needs to, and it's free as well. So it's also very, very good. Um, it's also very different from uh, the past era. You see, in the past, when we spoke of speaking, we always referred to a stage. Or we said acting, we also thought of a theater or a drama or a stage. But this generation is a lot of them is already into the, just the camera. So acting for screen is a reality. All right. Speaking to yourself in a screen is also a reality. So use this because the kids seem to be already empowered by it. So use it to a learning end and I think we're on good ground. Um, then of course there's vocaru.com, which is very good, simple web-based learning tool uh, for recording. Uh, you, that recording string, you can then email it, you can share it, um, you can attach it as a document and you can use it in a variety of social media outlets as well. So it can also be used as a feedback mechanism. Um, and uh, it's very simple to use. It's literally just a press of a button. Um, uh, these were some of the other tools that were there. Mentimeter.com, uh, Text Compactor, what Shoma spoke about the last week. Then there's Common Lit, which she also spoke about, Dream Reader, uh, Rewordify, and of course, the favorite with over 1 billion users, Kahoot. All right, so you can also use Kahoot. I know probably if you're in a school, then you are already using it. So um, this is it. By the way, this is a lovely book to read, Getting Started or Teaching Online. Uh, I'm going to click on this. Oops, sorry. I'm going to click on this because um, normally this book, I think, costs about three and a half, four thousand rupees. Uh, if you buy the digital Kindle version of it, it's about 1,400 rupees. But Kindle... If you take a subscription for three months, it's 169 rupees. So I'm clicking on it just because I want to show you what the table of contents is so that you can see how worthwhile it is. It has very detailed, some lesson plans, various other softwares or tools that you could use, um, which I think is really helpful and very, very user friendly. So it's a great place to start if you're still a little apprehensive and not so sure, then please uh, pay that 169 rupees for three months, finish reading the book. Um, you can snapshot or whatever the ideas are or bookmark it and you're on your way. Okay, so that's as regards, um, sorry, that's with regard this book, um, which is kind of bringing me almost towards the end, which is the last five uh, or the last 10 teaching tips that I'd like to share with you. Um, of course, many of you are already down the way, so you've probably already figured this out. But the first one, practice using the functions of the platform you want to use. So if it's Zoom, or if it's Google, or if it's Microsoft, try it on your own. Get everyone in the family who's, got, who's around you to all become little students of yours and try it with them. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Second, one objective per lesson. Okay, so if you try and be a Genghis Khan and conquer everything. Every time you were add the word and, you're adding a second objective. So keep it to one objective per lesson. All right. Plan each lesson around that one objective, okay, which means your materials, your interaction. Remember, I told you about the, our work that we need to do pre, post. We need to think through the delivery also of what we're going to do and the materials and what needs to be sent in advance and so on. Then start and finish each lesson by stating the object overtly, all right, or the objective, my opinion. I'm sorry, my apologies. It should have been my objective. Um, overtly, okay, it is still part of learning. Okay, so it's like doing a recap. Um, and anything learners can do on their own, let them to do it on their own. Um, so sometimes I know as teachers, we like a little bit of control freaks. Uh, this is not the time or the place because with technology, kids are already a little ahead of the curve. So flip the classroom. 
gives them stuff that is going to make it easier for them, which gives them more ownership, all right, as well as allows you that breathing space to concentrate on something that perhaps needs your attention and not their attention so much. Always ask questions, invite feedback <clears throat> all the time. Use the chat, use reactions, uh, use Google Forms, whatever you want. Have a plan B for each lesson. Finally, of course, working online does not mean working 24 seven. Set your hours and communicate them. And please don't forget to chill once in a while or definitely on the week or weekend or whenever, chill for a little while, all right, you've earned it, okay? Online teaching is physically zapping and exhausting and you are completely within um, your entitlement to just chill. Um, nine, of course, is trust. Trust yourself, trust your learners. And I think everything else will be fine. And finally, of course, remember it's business as usual. We are still the teachers. We still know the context of our learners. Only the medium has changed. Given what we've done in the last two months, I have no doubt that we will conquer it. Just give yourself a little bit of time and I think we'll be good with that.